This is the Animal Agenda, and I'm Tom Keish. Our guest this week is Dr. Melanie Wagner, the Bureau Manager for Long Beach Animal Care Services. Let me get my disclaimers out of the way. I'm speaking and asking questions as an individual in my own individual capacity. I currently volunteer for several shelter systems and have visited many others. I visited El Bax twice, once pre-Dr. Melanie Wagner and the second after she took the helm. On that visit, she met with me, gave me a transparent tour, seemed to know many of the animals. She holds a doctorate in leadership and change. She earned her PhD in leadership and change from Antioch University while serving as the education director for SPCALA. Her dissertation addressed using dogs to develop empathy in disaffected youth and prevent violence. For several years, she was the executive director of Kitty Bungalow, a TNR and socialization facility for street cats. She's a certified dog trainer. Apparently, as a child, she helped her parents at the Wildlife Rehab Center for Wolves and Mountain Lions. And that was their Wildlife Rehab Center, apparently. Hello, Dr. Melanie Wagner. Hey, Tom. Great to be here today. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you for being here. We first communicated because of Canine Kismet, a rescue whom I first met at another shelter when they were rescuing three dogs. And they were so happy and impressed by you that they wanted us to meet. So we met and it was such a great time. Um, I know we were supposed to meet for like a half hour and we spent many more hours than that. And I just was so impressed with you. I just wanted to have you on as a guest. So thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for coming down and visiting our our facility. Uh, I can always talk about the work we do here. So So let's, let's start with some stuff I already said, doctorate in leadership and change. So that's exactly what's needed at many different shelter systems. So can you explain why you pick that and how it's applicable in your job? Yeah, absolutely. You know, growing up, um, I was surrounded by both teachers and animal lovers, right? So yes, we had a wildlife rehabilitation center, but it was also about educating the community, educating the public, not just about the caretaking of animals, which obviously is incredibly important. Um, And so, you know, I spent years kind of working and in, in back and forth in those fields. My master's is actually in education. Uh, I love that field. I love people, but I also love animals. And I wanted to find a way to really connect those two things. And that's kind of how I ended up just in this trajectory and in this field is my love of animals and my love of community. And I, it's really hard to find a PhD that connects both of those things. Um, so I felt very fortunate to come across that program in Antioch where I felt I could um, get that degree and really, really apply it to this field, this ever-changing field, constantly moving, constantly changing, right? New programs, new life-saving techniques. Um, and I just, it, it's something that I love and I'm very happy to be able to apply that PhD to the work I do now. Well, I've talked to several rescues and several volunteers from Long Beach, and they're very impressed with what you did, what you do and what you're doing. And I, I was very impressed while I was there. Um, let's go back again. Wolves and mountain lions and being a child, that must have been like a dream of Narnia. So how was that? What was that like? Oh, goodness. You know, it's it's so funny. As an adult, I reflect back and it really was a dream of Narnia. But I will tell you, in my teenage years, when I was uh, chopping up roadkill to feed to the wildlife, uh, I'm not sure it was what I wanted to be doing at 14 years old. And I'm not sure that I appreciated it as much as I could have in the moment, just being transparent about that. But as I've grown up and I reflect back and I think, wow, you know, uh, not many people get to say they were raised by wolves and mean it. And I was, and it's a, it's, it's a pretty cool thing. Uh, and it's given me just such an appreciation, not only for cats and dogs, which my house was full of as a kid, but also just the wildlife, how we interact with them and the, and the wolves and mountain lions that we had, we had because people took them in as pets in improperly, right? Fed them incorrectly. Uh, one of our mountain lions had really bad scoliosis and one was permanently cross-eyed from malnutrition. So it couldn't be released into the wild. And so just learning how uh, how to, what's the word I'm looking for? Just how to interact with wildlife and how to really truly appreciate them and what our role in that relationship is. Actually, my first job was at a zoo. 
I, before I worked with cats and dogs. So it kind of led me down that path. And then I ended up here. So I want to ask you 20 questions out of the gate. Um, <laughs> but one of the things I loved about meeting with you was your transparency and honesty. And if that wasn't just proven with the phrase chopping up roadkill, I don't know what <laughs> would be. So I, I think that's refreshing. I think that's needed in today's um, animal services. I think that the sanitation of the language has really kind of um, hurt uh, animals in, in many ways. And I, I hope to talk about that later in our interview. Um, but still going back, your dissertation was using dogs to develop empathy in disaffected youth and prevent violence. So that also is amazing because I truly believe another key thing about solving the issues is the empathy that seems to be missing. So what did you learn in that dissertation? And I know you could probably go for hours on that, but in a nutshell, can you wrap that one up? Yeah, sure. Um, no problem. You know, that was my my life's work. I immersed myself in that for many, many years. Uh, not only did I write the dissertation, I was truly part of the program and its development. Um, and we took a look at both historical data of pre and post survey, so about a decade of that program prior to me even taking it over. And then um, we did current pre and post surveys and we threw in some journaling with the students. So it was both qualitative and quantitative to take a look at really capturing, capturing that data, but also capturing the narrative and the stories of the youth that we worked with, because those play an important role in what we see here, right? And so what we ended up finding was that in the short term, there was an increase in empathy. Most of these students um, had just never really learned empathy. And so much like in, in many forms of different training and dog training, right, certain skills, you can unlearn them and relearn them. And that was the approach we took in this field, that, you know, you can unlearn some uh, reactions to by through violence and relearn actions through empathy. And the dogs really, really helped embrace that and taught the students how to do that. So our, our, my research ended up showing that in the short term, empathy did increase uh, and that we saw behavior change because of it. What I what it didn't show, which I think is really important in research too, is the longitudinal piece of it. I wasn't able to do a study for the next 30 years and follow those students around and see if it impacted them. What I can tell you is that I did have a student in one of my first years of teaching who has since found me on Instagram and thanked me for the program and that it impacted his life in the long term and helped him really get where he needed to be. Uh, so that was that was pretty cool. I mean, that's not, you know, quantitative data, but it is it is a moment that meant something to someone. Well, um, so that's really my research. It, it reminds me a lot of the prison programs, the prison programs with dogs and, and some of the prisoners that I had met both at the prison and outside and how dogs change their lives and basically through empathy and compassion. So I, I think it's amazing. And I, I think it's great that someone in charge of a shelter system or a animal care services dug into that stuff, because I think that is important. And that, Again, I think empathy is part of the answer. So before we get too deep, uh, let's get some potentially confusing things out of the way. <laughs> the, the entrance booth, parking fees, two similar organizations in nearly the same spot, and how would you like to be addressed? <laughs> okay, got it. Um, all right, so when you pull into our, our facility, you, you know, people will see that toll booth. It can be a little, little confusing, although we are actually putting up new signage this week to oh, help excellent. clarify some of that. Um, some wayfinding signage is, is going in. Um, yeah, people come in. You can just let them know at the booth that you're heading to the animal shelter and you do not have to pay for parking to come visit us. Parking is for the El Dorado Nature Center, which is actually straight ahead. You hang left, you follow the paw prints on the driveway, uh, and that will lead people around to our facility. When you get to Long Beach Animal Care Services, it can be a little confusing. When you're looking at the building, there's a door on the left that says adoptions. That belongs to the SPCA LA. And then there's our central door that says admissions. And it can be a little misleading 
because we also do adoptions. So we do admissions and people find strays or bring us sick cats, but we also offer adoptions of cats, small animals, and dogs. Um, and as far as addressing me, I, you know, Tom, I, I'm really not that picky. My friends call me Doc Wags. I love that. Just one. because it's, <laughs> it's kind of cute, <laughs> I guess. It's very cute. <laughs> This is the Animal Agenda. I'm Tom Keish. Our guest is Dr. Melanie Wagner, the top dog for Long Beach Animal Care Services, LBAX. We're discussing specific and general challenges from her unique point of view. Besides uh, LBAX being responsible for Long Beach, I also found that it's responsible or extends services to Los Alamitos, Signal Hill, and Cerritos. Is that all correct? Correct. Yep. So, Let's say someone listens to this and they're like, boy, I, I love this woman's energy and uh, I think my, my animal would be better there than where I live. What's the policy on taking in dogs or cats or surrenders or strays? Sure. So for dogs, uh, we, we take in anything sick, injured, or stray from any of our cities. So Long Beach, Los Alamitos, Cerritos, uh, and Signal Hill. And, you know, it can get a little confusing because we do border with places like Lakewood. And I know, you know, people want to bring their dogs here. We do get it. We hear it a lot. We have a lovely facility. Um, but I really, really want to encourage people to take their dogs to the city shelter and which their city services. And the reason that's so important is that for most shelters, well, at least for us, I can speak to, uh, Returning our pet to an owner is one of the top priorities, right? And you can't do that if they're not in the city shelter system that somebody is told to go look in. It makes it a lot harder for people to find their pets if they don't go to the right facility. Um, so I absolutely encourage uh, if, they, if somebody does find a dog, first look in your neighborhood, look around, get it scanned at a vet clinic, try to do your best to get it home without bringing it into a shelter system. But if you do have to bring it to the shelter, try to really stay in the one in your jurisdiction. Um, it just, it really, really helps get animals home a lot faster. Um, so that's our policies. But if you're in a, one of our city service cities, we do... Sick, injured, we take in strays. For cats, um, this is really important. We, we don't take in healthy outside cats. We will provide vouchers to get them fixed, but we do not take in healthy outdoor cats roaming around. So if it's a healthy stray, we suggest you get it fixed and put it back. Uh, but we do take in sick and injured cats at all time. We also take in sick and injured wildlife, which a lot of people don't know. Uh, and about 80% of that wildlife ends up going to a rescue or rehab center because that's where they can treat them better than we can. Excellent. So. Those are questions down my road here. So uh, some quick questions. What's LBAC's capacity for animals, kennels, cats, enclosures, that sort of thing? Yeah. So for dogs, our kennel capacity right now is 100 kennels. Uh, to give you a little frame of reference, we currently have 106 dogs. Um, so we are absolutely over capacity right now um what we end up having to do is pop up a couple of large crates but it's just temporary so usually it's a really fluid movement we use those as overflow um we have six extra overflow crates nobody likes them nobody wants to use them it's not ideal but it is what we have to do when we have a shelter full of really good dogs um that just need a holdover until we can get them into their their more long-term kennel situation so that's 100 dogs uh we have 106 and, and tom i don't know if you know but we don't like to double up uh, unless they come from the same home or are a bonded pair we're not going to double up dogs in kennels uh, just for their own health and well-being and safety and for cats, we can we have this one gets a little tricky. We have 160 uh, kennels, but obviously you can double up cats, or you have moms and litters. Um, right now, we only have about 44 cats in our care. But ask me in mid July or August, and it'll be closer to probably 300. Right, cat season. Yep, still a thing. Yep. Um, so we talked about dogs and cats, but um, I know other shelters have bunnies, turtles, snakes, spiders, goats, pigs, sheep, and horses, <laughs> wildlife. So what's the most unusual thing that's been at Elbeck since you've been there? Oh, my goodness. Most unusual. 
No, we haven't had, we had a, we had a duck recently, a little Peking duck, which was super cute. She had a crooked neck and we sent her off to rescue. Um, I mean, I don't know about most, I guess some people find this interesting. I'm just obsessed. We get baby raccoons and I just love them. Yeah. <laughs> They're so cute. Uh, and then. But I, but I want to touch on this in the state of California, raccoons are not pets. Correct. Uh, and so they are, they no. are treated so they go as to, wildlife. They go to a specific licensed rehabber. Yes. Right. And since but we're if on you're this... asking for pets, sorry, Tom, I was gonna say, if you're asking for oh. pets, I'd say, you know, we got a really cool al albino snake in an albino boa about a month and a half ago. And I thought that was pretty neat. So. That's cool. So yeah. uh, while we're on this topic, I wasn't going to hit this, but why are certain pets not allowed in? There are certain pets that are allowed in California. Why is that? Can you put an answer on that? You, are you referring to like, like the, uh, what, uh, there's the guinea pigs are gerbils? guinea pigs are allowed, but gerbils are not. Yeah, correct. As far as I understand it, it is because uh, both ferrets and gerbils, if they were to get loose, can be a highly invasive species that can eradicate other populations. So like a gerbil could technically take over desert life and, and eradicate like a kangaroo mouse population. So as far as, that's, as far as I know, that's why we can't have certain pets, just because of the risk. That's what I've always been told. Yeah. Um, approx approximate save rate? Um, I'm not going to hold you to this, but do you have an approximate save rate? I do, actually. So um, I just actually pulled the report right before I got on to take a look. Uh, but this year so far, uh, our, our euthanasia rate for dogs is at 5%. This is from January 1. So we're looking at about a 95% save rate for dogs currently. Um, and for cats, our euthanasia rate is 11%. So it's an 89% uh, life-saving rate for cats. I will say I just want to put this little addendum to that. We only intake sick and injured cats. We do not in and underage cats, of course. We do not intake healthy adults. So, in my opinion, our euthanasia rate for cats is always going to be a smidgen higher, simply because the population are all sick when they come to us, versus dogs, where we do take in both sick and healthy populations. But that's our numbers right now. So. I'm not a expert in shelters or shelter management, but there's all these terms, uh, compassion saves or no kill or um, compassionate kenneling. I, I don't know what they all are. What is the current model that Long Beach prescribes or adheres to? Yeah, we, we adhere to the compassion saves model, which has less about the 90% the number, which is more your no kill trajectory. Um, compassion saves adheres to the policy and it's very very similar to no kill it's just we don't necessarily have that strict 90 percent rule compassion save says you save every savable animal which is why we have a relationship with long beach animal emergency um i'm not sure of other municipal shelters having that but we have a 24-hour round-the-clock care so if our officers pick up a hit by car at three in the morning that animal is going directly to an emergency hospital to have care provided to it because being hit by a car in and of itself could be a savable condition right and so we we just adhere to saving anything that we can within reason. So that puts kind of our euthanasia rate for animals who are truly suffering um, or are just so far gone that even our, our veterinary hospital or external hospital will recommend euthanasia. It also includes um, significant aggression and uh, deterioration in the kennel, which is still, you know, can be a little subjective and these animals get a lot more time. We have a rescue list that we put them on to try to get like our, our dogs who are, um, who are deteriorating out into a rescue first, but they are on, they are on the at-risk list as well. You're listening to The Animal Agenda on KPFK. I'm Tom Keish, and I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Melanie Wagner from LBAX. That's Long Beach Animal Care Services. Um, one thing we discussed uh, at our time that we spent together was depth and width, or I don't, I, I'm not Breath. sure exactly <laughs> that's what you said. Um, so what is animal services and what did you mean by depth and width? Yeah, so uh, I think what I said was uh, breadth and depth. So, 
you know, breadth is this, this casting a wide net concept and depth is being able to go really, really, you know, obviously in depth into a situation. When I look at the big picture of animal sheltering, and this is something that's really important to me, is we all, municipal shelters, rescues the community we all play a part in this it's like one big puzzle right and we have to have each have our piece to that puzzle in order to make it a whole and for municipal shelters to me we are the breath we are the, the cast the wide net right we can handle six thousand animals a year and that that's about our intake and so we're casting this wide net, we're providing the best care that we can, but you can't provide in-depth critical care for long periods of time while simultaneously handling 6,000, right? So our rescues, our individual communities, like community members, they are the depth. They are the ones that when we say, hey, we have these animals on a list because we need help we're taking in hundreds of dogs and cats every month. And we have, you know, a dog with a huge laceration and needs, you know, repair surgery or can't sit in the can't sit in the kennel because they have a, a bone degeneration problem and they're in a lot of pain. I mean, there's a million things we see here. But the community and rescues, they have their niches. They can provide the depth for the care that these animals need. And so together is how I believe we paint this really, really kind of comprehensive picture of life saving. We can handle the most and then the community can handle the depth, if that makes sense. It, it does. And since we're running out of time. Um, I'm sorry. I, no, um, <laughs> I'm such I a want it, uh, no, it's awesome. And I, and I want to continue this conversation past this one episode. But what I really want to get in this episode is that when we did, when I did the tour with you, the volunteer program was on hold because it was being revamped. And can you tell me if it's now open and what changes and how people can volunteer? Because that's part of the breadth and the depth, correct? It is. Absolutely. Um, yes, it is officially open. People can visit our website um, at longbeach.gov forward slash ACS and fill out a volunteer application. Uh, basically, the changes we made, we're just putting a proper trainings in place, getting everyone here currently on the same page, developing an orientation so that onboarding volunteers was all pretty consistent and new volunteers would know what to expect. Um, I feel like the safety of our volunteers is one of our utmost concerns here. And I wanted to make sure that um, we were able to provide those kind of trainings for our volunteers before they start and before something happens. Uh, we were also without a volunteer coordinator. And so we have a new one now. We started a couple of months ago. It's helped us get where we need to be. And I am just very, very excited uh, people come, socialize cats, walk dogs, help us with anything. Laundry, it never ends. You can help us with literally anything. And so once again, if somebody wants to volunteer from Long Beach, first off, they don't have to be from Long Beach, correct? And how would okay. they go about signing up or how do they do the orientation? Yeah, longbeach.gov forward slash ACS. Just fill out a quick volunteer um, application, just telling us a little bit about you. And then our volunteer coordinator will be in touch and there will be orientation dates. We're going to have, we have two orientations a month. So we're really hoping one on the weekend, one during the week each month to really kind of, you know, get as many people as possible. Uh, yeah, and that's it. Just, just sign up, fill out the application and somebody will be in touch pretty soon. So besides volunteering, what can the people of Long Beach do to help you do your job better and to help animals? It's a great question. Um, fostering, if anyone can open their home up to fostering, even if it's giving a super friendly dog just a temporary break. Um, we have an emergency kitten foster program as well, where we we only ask somebody to watch bottle babies for one to three days just to buy us the cushion so that we don't have to euthanize uh, while our foster coordinator finds a more permanent placement, like a long-term foster or rescue. So we have a bunch of different options, even just short-term fostering. Uh, encourage the community to come adopt from us. 
Uh, I also encourage people, I think I mentioned this before, if you do find stray animals, look in your neighborhood first before bringing them to us. Um, almost always like 90% or something of animals go home if they're just uh, pre presented in their neighborhood as being lost and on those different platforms. Um, and I mean, honestly, just spread the word. Come, come visit us. Come see, come see what we're all about here at Long Beach Animal Care Services. I, I love that transparency, openness, honesty. I think again that those are all things that'll help the situation. So we have listeners in different states and different countries. Is there anything they can do to help? That's a great. That's a great question. Um, well. I mean, I'm a big fan of social media, so they could always follow us on socials, help share our material. You know, the more we boost our algorithms, the more the visibility goes up. Uh, outside of that, you know, so donate. We do have a trust. So at our website, it's Beach, uh, longbeach.gov forward slash ACS. There is an opportunity where they can go to donate and donate directly to a trust fund that goes specifically to Long Beach Animal Care Services and not a general um, city fund. Excellent. And um, we are getting towards the end of our time. And I would love to continue this conversation. I'm going to put you on the spot. Are you willing to continue this conversation? Because I literally have nine more pages of, of questions <laughs> that I know I'll never get to, but I would love to keep talking. Well, twist my arm, Tom. I suppose I can keep talking about animals a little bit longer. <laughs> All right. So I want to thank you for being on this episode, and we will continue the conversation for a future episode. Um, and we'll get into things like um, if what legislation you think could help animals, strictly in your own opinion, uh, what's the greatest challenges that LBAX is facing today that you have no control over, uh, what's the questions that you hear the most of, but we'll get into that in the next one. But uh, for this week, we're going to wrap up and everyone you've been listening to the animal agenda. Our guest this week has been Dr. Melanie Wagner or Dr. Wags from Long Beach Animal Care Services, LBAX. If you missed any part of this program, you can visit kpfk.org slash archives and stream or download it. For more information on LBAX, go to their website, www.longbeach.gov slash ACS or their Instagram at LB Animal Care. I want to give special thanks to Melody King and producer Marlena Bond, who just in fact gave us the green light to continue this conversation. So this next conversation, tune in in a future week to hear it. Anyway, stay tuned for the Lawyers Guild with Jim Lafferty coming up next. And please... Please support listener-sponsored KPFK by donating online at kpfk.org or by calling 818-985-KPFK.